Good afternoon, and again, welcome to the World Aquatic Health Conference. To try and stay on time here, we're going to continue on with comparative toxic toxicity of water from disinfected recreational pools. Here's the other. Dr. Michael Pleva is a university scholar and professor of genetics, College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences, member of the campus honors faculty, and Water Camps WS program. Also associate director for research of the University UI uh, Water Center. Great. Doctor. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is, I, I, I'm not going to talk about human health. What I'm going to talk about is a couple rang, a rungs lower than that. I'm going to talk about some basic research in, uh, in, in biology and toxicology, and then uh, uh, describe the tools that we're using, and then we're going to apply them to swimming pools to see what can we do to modify or to change environmental conditions in swimming pools to, re to reduce the toxicity of the water in those pools. Now, I have to be careful here because I'm equating uh, my metrics, my measurements is going to be toxicity. It's not health. There is a relationship between being exposed to toxins and reduction in health, but they're not the same. So keep that in mind. On the other hand, we can get an answer in a short period of time. In other words, you do X, you get a reduction in toxicity, rather than waiting 30 years to see if you get a reduction in cancer rates or something like that. So please look at these genetic, these bioassays that I'm talk, going to talk about as tools that might be able to be applied to uh, improving the quality of water in, in, uh, in, in swimming pools. Okay, so let's see. Okay, well, first of all, just like Manolis mentioned, um, perhaps the greatest public health achievement of the 20th century was the disinfection of water. And I can make, I mean, it's better than polio vaccines. It's better than uh, any other type of intervention of public health. Currently, billions of people escape uh, uh, a waterborne disease because of disinfection. So the first thing we have to understand, anything that we talk about here is that we're talking about making good water better. We're not talking about eliminating disinfection. You eliminate disinfection, we go back to color. And so we don't want to see that. So uh, one of the problems, though, when you disinfect water is that you generate DBPs. And DBPs are the products that are generated when you have organic material in the water, which all waters contain, and the disinfectant and you'll end up with these disinfection byproducts, which were first discovered in 1974. Uh, oh, and, and over 600, maybe 700, have been identified by the analytical chemists. And even with chlorination, we don't know what all of them are. When you look at, uh, this is from a, uh, a paper that Elizabeth and I did, but the data was derived from the Krasner uh, uh, report on the nationwide study report, even when they did this enormous, this intense chemical analysis of drinking waters across the United States, 70% of the DBPs that, they, uh, that, that, that were identified as the TOX fraction, the total organic halide fraction, were unidentifiable. So we only know about 30% of the DBPs that are actually present in waters. That's in drinking waters, and I can assure you there are more DBPs in pool waters than there are in drinking waters. So where, how do we fit in these toxicological studies and health? So we're in this area of, of research. So we're talking about working with uh, of mechanisms and with in vitro tests. Here's health. You, un you understand this type of dose response assessment. You can get relative levels of whether or not one DBP is more toxic than another DBP, whether one pool treatment generates water that is more toxic than another level, another type of pool treatment, and that's what we're trying to work with. So these are predictive of human health, but they are not definitive. definitive. They are not health metrics, they're toxicological metri metri metrics. So let's talk about <laughs> DBPs. Why are we concerned about DBPs? Well, we're worried about DBPs because in the literature for the last 35 years, it has been shown that DBPs are toxic, neurotoxic, teratogenic, 
genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, and induce adverse pregnancy outcomes. About 15 years ago in my laboratory, so I'm a, I'm a, a, genetic, I'm a genetic toxicologist, I was having some discussions with colleagues of mine in the College of Engineering who were working on uh, calculating out the formation of DBPs. And one of my colleagues asked whether or not there was a standard way to measure toxicity of DBPs. And I went into the literature to look for this, and it, I, was, I was appalled by the state of the biological literature. I mean, you had some people working on rats, some people working on mice, some people working on salmonella, some people working on E. coli, some people working on newts. I mean, there was no standardized situation. You had no, you had no way of comparing a THM published by Professor A with a haloacetic acid published by Professor B. You could not jam this data together. So looking at that, I said, there is a real opportunity here to develop a systematic, comparative toxicological database, in vitro toxicological database, so we can ask a simple question. What DBPs are more toxic than other DBPs, number one? Number two, does the chemistry, can you predict from the chemistry which, which DBPs are going to be more toxic? And if you can do that, can you modify the chemistry of disinfection to reduce the toxicity of water? There is a little problem, though, and the problem is that most of these DBPs uh, that are not the traditional ones, like the THMs or HIAs, most of the DBPs that are not regulated are not commercially available. So that means you have to synthesize them. And think dollar signs with synthesis. It cost enormous amount of monies to get these DBPs synthesized. So what we did was link up with a colleague of mine, Susan Richardson at US EPA, who we call her Ms. DBP because Susan has probably discovered more DBPs than anybody else on the planet. But she also does this work with GC mass spec and LC mass spec and mass spec mass spec analysis, she has to have she has to have standards to confirm her identification of new DBPs. So by begging her and groveling in the dust and doing all kinds of things, I got from her. When, so an EPA would stand would pay for the synthesis of a DBP. They'd probably generate 100 milligrams. I would beg for 50 milligrams. That's great. But 50 milligrams is not enough to do a single AIMS test. It is such a small amount of material. The assays at the time that we began these studies were insufficient. The amount of material obtained was insufficient to actually do standard toxicological studies. So we got a water, a water uh, so AWARF, or now it's called Water Research Foundation grant, and we got a US EPA star grant. And this allowed my laboratory to actually develop specific assays that could be used for the analysis of DBPs when we had very small amounts of material. And I'm going to show you what those, stand, those assays are now, and then I'm going to apply those assays to swimming pools. Okay. So first one is cytotoxicity. What is cytotoxicity? Well, what it means is that if you take a chemical and you give it to a cell, the cell croaks. Okay? So, if you have lots of cells, like, you know, like th thousands and thousands and, and tens of thousands, and you increase the concentration of your test agent, you can see an ever-increasing level of cells that uh, survive. So cytotoxicity is a very general, broad assay. Anything that's going to kill the cell will be expressed. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very broad. It doesn't give me mechanism. It gives me an effect. The problem is, is that you really want tight concentration response curves to make predictions. So um, uh, what can happen is that you can kill cells by, uh, by have them lose membrane integrity. You can, you, can, you can prevent cells from growing if you stop, if you stop cell cycle, or you can cause genetic, you can also uh, in, in, initiate a, a, a process called apoptosis, which will, for instance, cause cells just to drop dead because of different types of gene expression. We don't care what the basis of this is. We want to know if I take this concentration uh, of DBPs, to, uh, of a specific DBP, what is the concentration in which half of the cells have died and half the cells have lived? So what we did was 
we want it to be very comprehensive. There are a number of cytotoxicity assays that are available, but they don't measure all possible possibilities of why cells don't uh, grow completely. And so we developed an assay based on this density of cells on microplates. And so this is a, this is a, 60, a 96 well microplate. We have a control. We have a blank to measure, uh, to measure, uh, 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 the, the, to make a, a foundation level of measurement. And then we have increase. We have from very low levels of, of toxicity of, of cell of um, of test agent to a much higher level of test agent. And each micro well is an independent clone. And so we're able. Over, and then we're, we're exposing these cells for 72 hours. So essentially, we have a three, we have a chronic assay. Why? These cells, their dividing time, their replication time is about 22 hours. So we have three generations of cells. So this is all actually allowing us to use concentrations over a long time period for a cell. And then we're able to uh, collect data and make a spreadsheet. Now, with the, the cells that we're using are CHO cells, the Chinese hamster ovary cells. It's not that we love Chinese hamsters or ovaries, but the reason that we use these cells is because this is a cell line that was developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the 19, oh gosh, 50s and 60s. Um, that has a long history of use, and the thing that makes these cells nice is that they are cells that are immortalized. In other words, I can grow these cells in the laboratory and just keep on transferring them from plate to plate to plate. They will grow essentially forever. However, they are not neoplastic. You'll notice some people ask me, why don't you use human cells? Well, the only human cells that I know that are immortalized are tumor cell lines, and tumor cell lines are all screwed up. That's why they're called, that's why we call them tumor cell lines. These cells are not tumors. What happens is that when these cells grow and, they, uh, and the entire plate, of, they, they grow in a monolayer, when all the cells touch each other, they stop growing. They're not neoplastic. They don't pile up on top of each other like a tumor. For instance, I still have the same razor that I bought when I was 15. So it's one of these you know, shick razors. And I always cut myself with this stupid thing. So I put a piece of toilet paper on my face. And I walk, I'm ready to walk out of the house. My yell, wife yells at me. When I cut myself, I want something to happen. I want the cells in the womb to start dividing. So signals go out and said, you know, Michael cut himself, the moron, start dividing. So DNA starts replicating. The cells start growing. And when the wound heals, I want something else to happen. I want them to stop. I, want to, I don't want to walk around like this on the side of my head. And that's what these cells do. They have what is known as cell contact inhibition. Tumor cells don't know how to stop. So that makes a big difference. So these cells here are more like normal cells, but as much as normal cells you can have in a Petri plate. And so that's why we use these particular cells. So uh, I want to point out also, in my talk here, I give complete references to every reference, to, to everything that's on each slide. If you want these references, uh, if you want the paper, send me an email. My email is, is uh, there. And send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you these papers from uh, uh, either mine or others uh, uh, as PDF files. So uh, when you get it off your CD, you'll see these complete references. And so that can, if you have any questions, you can look at that. This is a typical concentration response curve, of, in this case, for dibromoacid amide, a DBP. Here's our concentration response curve. These are standard errors. We have in here between 8 and 32 independent clones. So we got big numbers. What we measure is we, we run a regression analysis through this, and we measure the concentration of the DBP that would give us a 50% cell density. Now, I didn't say cell killing. I said cell density. So agents that stop DNA division or stop cell division would also cause this. So this is a, this is a very, very broad metric. Of, uh, of, of cytotoxicity. So uh, you can publish. So one of the things that we want to do was to say, OK, what happens when we have different types of DBPs? Can we separate one? Can we separate those DBPs that are more toxic than other DBPs? So here's the entire class of haloacid amides. These are emerging DBPs in drinking water. They'll be present in pools also. And you can see I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 
halo acid amides, from the iodinated acid amides to the chlorinated acid amides. And this is a log scale. We have six log orders of concentration. And this is their progression. These are all concentration response curves. I don't have the standard error bars because it'd be too busy. But the thing that's interesting about here is that clearly, based on their chemistry, I can show that there is a difference in toxicity, in some cases by log orders of toxicity. And this gives us a powerful tool uh, to, uh, to analyze these compounds. Now, one way of doing to, 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 to stand back and see the real big picture, let's say we just took the LC50 values for each of these. I could then just use that single number, if I can go back one, I can use just a single number here to represent the entire uh, sets of experiments that this concentration response curve ha has done. The thing I want to imp impress you with is that this LC50, or percent C1 half value, this LC50 value right here is based on many, many replicates. So there's a great, this, these data are very robust. Now, th this is an impossible slide to see. It's, we call it a lollipop graph. Each point is the LC50 value for these different classes. So here are different classes of, of uh, of, uh, of uh, DBPs, here's their concentration over five log orders of concentrations. And this is the midpoint of those concentration response curves. What I'm trying to do is convince you is that we can actually detect very, very uh, different, we can identify differences within classes of DBPs and among classes of DBPs. And the thing that strikes you right away is that the compounds that are used, like the halomethanes, are some of the least toxic compounds, while many of these, uh, uh, many of these emerging DBPs, like the acid amides, nitriles, uh, uh, halonitromethanes, and iodinated compounds, are the most toxic. So in its wisdom, EPA has managed to pick the least toxic concentrations to regulate. And it's really not their fault because many of these uh, DBPs were not known when those regulations came out. But this is a very good way of standing back and looking at the whole picture. We now have, um, we did this for a Water Research Foundation grant. We did 54. We're now at 80 in our laboratory in which we have detailed concentration response curves for individual DBPs. So that's cytotoxicity. Now, cytotoxicity is important because it can lead to, to birth defects. It can also lead to neuro neurological defects. Okay, some because what you're doing there is, especially if you have a young embryo, if you're killing types of specific types of cells, you can lead to, to, to birth defects and, uh, and, and um, uh, problems such as that. Genotoxicity is more associated with things like cancer induction. Uh, because all tumors, all, can all cancers are genetic in origin. A tumor, a, 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 a cell in a tumor is clonal all the way to the original neoplastic mother cell. And all cells within tumors are merely uh, are, uh, daughter cells. They all, and, and now, in fact, scientists are actually identifying, are, chemo are, are choreographing the numbers and types of mutations necessary to go from a normal cell into a fully metastasizing tumor. And so those, those maps are now being published in, in journals such as Science and Nature. This is very exciting. But the bottom line to go from a normal cell to a tumor cell is that that cell has mutated. Genotoxins are agents that damage DNA, that then that damaged DNA can lead to, uh, to, to, to mutation. So <clears throat> the acid that we use is single-cell gel electrophoresis. And again, I'm trying to develop assays that are mammalian cell-based. And also remember, I don't have lots of compound. I have very small amounts of material to work with in many of these cases. So in these assays here, again, we use 96 well plates. But the total volume for our experiment is 25 microliters. So if I use a very small amount of a very small volume, I'm using very small amounts of material. But even, but, but, even be, but because the volumes are so small, I can go to very high molar concentrations. And what we're measuring is a whole series of, a whole series of different types of DNA damage that can be converted into double strand breaks. And then what happens is that this is a nucleus, and this nucleus is actually in a microgel. 
you electrophoresis the gel. So, so think about electrophoresis is this. DNA in your cells isn't the size of a chromosome. That's huge. I mean, it's monstrous. So if you break up that DNA, um, that would be an indicator of genomic DNA dam genomic damage. In a way of separating that is like uh, running this material through gel. So DNA has a net negative charge. If you put DNA in an electric field, it's going to migrate toward the positive pole. We're using electrophoresis with gels. Gel is like jello, okay? So what happens is that the smaller pieces can go through the jello much faster than the larger pieces. So a three year old would be able to run through, if we converted this whole room into jello, a three year old would be able to run through this room much faster than I would be able to run through this room. So the larger the pieces, the harder it is to run through this, uh, this uh, gel. So and this is a case here. Here's our controls. These cells have not been exposed to a DBP. This is dibromonitromethane. Here we have a concentration, 30 micromolar, and you can see that the nucleus is showing a, uh, a movement of the DNA into the gel. Here's 40 micromolar. Almost all the DNA has been moved into the gel, has migrated into the gel. These all have been electrophoresed, and the only reason that you get these type of images is because the DNA has been damaged, it's been fragmented, and it's now moving into the gel. We do all our studies at non-toxic concentrations. This is a four-hour treatment group. Remember, cytotoxicity is chronic. That's 72 hours exposure. This is four-hour exposure, and the reason is, is that if I'm damaging DNA at low levels, DNA repair can kick in, and that can actually wipe out our, our assay. So we try to do it before we have a large amount of DNA repair. So this is a requirement of this type of uh, technology. And we, again, we get these concentration response curves and at the midpoint of the concentration response curve, we can come up with a genotoxic potency value. So again, let's go back to the halo acid amides. You can see we can go from, from agents that are essentially non-genotoxic to agents that are very uh, genotoxic. And so it's the same class of compounds, but all we've done is substitute the halogen groups, either number or type, uh, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and the numbers of these onto these molecules, and we get a wide range of response over four log orders. And again, here's the lollipop graphs for that. So you can see different chemical classes, and you can see that we get different responses. And I think that the thing that's, that's, that's really, uh, again, important here, it tells us the relative genotoxicities of these and says which compounds, which classes of DBPs should, be, should we be more concerned about. So um, let's see. I just want to go. Oh, yeah. So here's, here's kind of a take home or, or kind of a, if I take all the data that we've done uh, in the last decade and jam them onto a graph, we get something that looks like this. So here are different uh, uh, DBP chemical classes. This is a log scale. The black bars represent cytotoxicity. The uh, 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 the gray bars represent genotoxicity. So I've taken all those classes, though, so I've converted all those values into index values and just added them together. And you can see that the agents that we, that we by, by EPA regulation, the halomethanes and the halo, five haloacetic acids, are relative, are, are cytotoxic and indeed genotoxic. But when we get to emerging DBPs like nitriles, acid amides, nitromethanes, and aldehydes, we find that they're all much more geno cytotoxic and more genotoxic than the regulated DBPs. And again, remember, we only know 30% of the DBPs that are present, uh, at least in drinking water. But this gives us information. This gives us knowledge. It tells us which ones we should be worried about and which ones we should be less worried about. Now, let's go to swimming pools. Swimming pools are DBP reactors. So unlike drinking water, where you take source water, disinfect that water, and send it out to the public, DB, uh, uh, and, and the DBPs that are generated are either generated at the point of disinfection or in the distribution system, pools have the added difficulty in that the water doesn't, you don't change your water every day. You recycle your water. And uh, it is clear from the literature that you get higher levels of DBPs in swimming pools than you do uh, with, uh, than you do with, uh, with drinking water. 
Also, in drinking water, the, the, the inputs of total organic material are humic acids primarily and, and fulvic acids. Uh, um, things that like, you know, the, um, the, the de degradation products of leaves. I, I'm from Chicago, so in Lake Michigan we throw bodies on, with cement and things like that. So I mean, you know, you get these kind of, you have dead animals, dead plants, and that's where you're getting a lot of your organic material. Some pesticides probably if you're getting surface waters from around agricultural areas. But in swimming pools, you have the same things. You're getting your water from tap water, so those DBPs are coming in, but then you're dumping people into it, and we're great sources of organic material. Uh, we contribute uh, <coughs> organic material from uh, DBP precursors, such as sweat, uh, skin falling off, uh, personal cosmetic materials that we wear and stuff like that. Uh, and, uh, consumer products in urine. And this water then is, is, re is re disinfected and returned back into the swimming pool. And it kind of goes into this, uh, into this cycle. But this also gives us a chance to ask the question I'm doing these things to that water that's in the swimming pool. I have that swimming pool in different environments. Some are open to the air, some are enclosed. What effect does this water have? What effect do these environmental and disinfection practices have? on the toxicity of drinking water, or I'm sorry, the toxicity of pool water. Now again, I'm talking about toxicity. I'm not saying that this level of toxicity equals an adverse health effect. Please be clear about that. What I'm saying is that this is a red flag. Perhaps we, should, we could use this as a tool to find ways of modulating the way that we work with pool water to reduce that total toxicity. So, um, why are we concerned? Well, disinfection, rec uh, uh, we have to disinfect recreational pool water because of microbial and, and protozoan pathogens. We this morning, we heard about the infectivity level of, uh, of uh, uh, Cryptosporidium parvum. It, one to 10 oocytes is not really a very high level of infectivity. They're very hard to get rid of. You, they're, they're they tend to be uh, rather insensitive to chlorine, uh, you can you can wipe them out with the good filtration processes. You can wipe you can you can retard them with good filtration processes. You can wipe them out with chlorine and uh, UV, but they're a very hard uh, nut to crack. You have to keep your pathogens lower so you don't end up with uh, waterborne disease uh, in in public pools. Uh, a wide diversity of DBPs at relatively high concentrations are found in rec recreational pools. And there is this whole epidemiological uh, series of studies that link swimming pools and disinfected, uh, 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 swimming and disinfected water with increased risks of uh, things such as bladder cancer, but also some other adverse conditions. And I think Manolis did a wonderful job explaining to you the levels of uncertainty that, that, that his group has worked with, and he's probably the gold standard of epidemiological studies uh, in drinking water and in pools in the world. So um, recreational pools represent an extreme of disinfected water having ele elevated uh, disinfectant exposures. So what is, our what is our objectives of the studies I'm going to tell you right now? So I've given you the tools that we developed. We developed them for drinking water, but they apply perfectly for pool water. And now with this tool, we can ask some very basic questions. And these are just kind of questions off the top. I mean, there's all kinds of much deeper questions that could be, an that could be asked. But for these two things, they're going to be very simple-minded indeed. So we develop a, an experimental design where the recreational waters would derive from the same tap water. That was one of the real issues. So in reviewing the literature, one of the confounders was that you can do a study in city A and city B and city C, or sometimes three or four different pools in the same city, but they're all getting different water, they're all getting different sources of tap water. So it's really hard to talk about what I'm doing if my, if my inputs are different. So Bill Mitch, who's a uh, associate professor of chemical engineering at Yale University and I, were at, an, at a meeting, we drank too many beers, and we agreed to do a project together. Uh, and so we decided to use New Haven because New Haven, which was, there was an interesting characters, characteristic of New Haven, uh, there were a series of pools in New Haven that all got their water from the same tap water source. We go, ooh, that's really good. 
So, uh, you know, we wrote a grant proposal, and then we have these different, uh, these different pools. So these are all different uh, pools. These, but the thing that's interesting about them, we have our New Haven tap water source. That's our control. That's our negative control. We have different disinfectants, UV and free chlorine, a brominated a disinfectant, bromo chloro dimethylhydanton, and then pools that are that are uh, with free are disinfected with free chlorine. We also have pools that are indoor pools and outdoor pools. We also have pools. We also have one pool that in the summertime the roof moves back and it's an outdoor pool. That same pool in the wintertime the, the roof comes over. It's an indoor pool. So we could ask these very simple-minded questions with these very sophisticated uh, uh, t uh, biological techniques to ask the question. Can we show, show differences in disinfection, uh, in, in toxicity of the water that's in these pools? Now, I can come up with 100 different experimental flaws in this study, but those are the, the basic questions that were asked. So how did we work with these compounds? So uh, we're not going to be shipping um, 100 liters of water from each pool to my laboratory. What we did instead was take water and we concentrated all the organics out. Remember, disinfection byproducts are organic materials. So uh, there's a different series, there were different ways of isolating uh, disinfection byproducts from water. Uh, and uh, we, you can use XAD, you can use solvent extraction. We decided to use solvent extraction pardon me, and they were extract, the, the eight to 10 liter samples were collected from these different pools. The samples were extracted into an organic uh, solvent. They were concentrated. Then the concentrated organic solvents were sent to me. I solvent exchanged them into dimethyl sulfoxide, which sterilizes the material, and also di DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, is miscible with water. Then I can up dilute them into the medium that the cells are growing. And then the samples were, uh, were then assayed uh, for chronic cytotoxicity and genomic DNA damage in uh, CHO cells. So here are some of our results. So this is a concentration response curve for water sample five. And I'll explain what the, when we get to the, when I, when I get to the uh, summary slides, I'll explain what all these different samples sizes are. So here we have a concentration response curve. This looks very much like concentration response curves for the pure compounds, does it not? But this is a complex mixture. This is a concentration, uh, this is a, 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 a the concentrated organics from this uh, a pool, and we end up with an LC50 value, not in terms of molar concentration, because we don't know what the molar concentration is, these are a complex mixture, but we can base these on concentration factors. So 20 X is our concentration factor at this middle of the concentration response curve. And that's its level, of to that, that, its level of cytotoxicity. And now we can take that and compare it to the negative control, or we can compare it to other uh, assays. And you can see here, these are the concentration response curves, and this is a log scale here, for all of these uh, different pools. And so we then could come up. So so what happens here is that the, the, the lower this number, the more toxic it is. The higher this number, the least toxic it is. That seems counterintuitive when you're trying to talk about this stuff. So, you know, scientists always like to make simple things more complicated through mathematics. So what we did is that we just made a cytotoxicity index value, which is really simple-minded. We just took the reciprocal of the LC50 and multiplied it by a fudge factor so we'd end up with, integral, with uh, integers that were easy to see. And then we can plot them out. So now in this case here, the going this way, going to the bigger numbers is more toxic. The smaller numbers are least toxic. And you can then see that we have these different samples, and we do get different levels of response. The thing that's important here is that the tap water, the tap water, uh, and the reason we use these numbers um, that when we were working with this is because when my students and I were doing this, and I did a lot, of, I did a, a considerable amount of this work with my own hands. I love to work in the laboratory. Elizabeth coded all these samples, and so when we were working in the laboratory, we didn't really know what the control was. We didn't know what, what the various samples were. So you can, it, the thing, first of all, is that the control, the tap water sample, is lower. So from this, it demonstrates that 
all pools had higher levels of toxicity, no matter what you did, than the, uh, than the incoming uh, tap water. However, from this data here, we can make a couple of overall comments from, from that. Number one, pools subjected to a combination of UV and free chlorine disinfection indoors or outdoor sunlight exposure, they all exhibited lower cytotoxicity uh, than their indoor counterparts disinfected with free chlorine. So the first thing is, is that if you have a pool outside, you get less toxic water. If you use UV plus, UV plus chlorine, using the same tap water, if you use UV plus chlorine, you get less cytotoxicity than if you use chlorine alone. Uh, temperature, or total organic carbon content, uh, uh, as indirect measures of DVP precursors were less important. Let's think about genotoxic response. And so the cytotoxicity, remember, is a much general uh, type of, 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 uh, of, of response assay. Let's look at genotoxicity. So here's our genotoxicity. We had to go up to 3,000 fold concentration in the tap water to get a nice, to get a, a concentration response curve for genomic DNA data. Here is pool sample one. This, uh, this range here from one to 10 is right about here. So you can see pool sample one is giving us a much higher level of genomic DNA damage than the incoming tap water. And again, here are all of the samples uh, from one to nine. And we can see that here's your tap water samples. And some had much higher levels of genotoxicity. This is a log scale. And some had intermediate ones. What can we learn from this? So again, we developed a genotoxic index value. So we took our concentration response curves. We did a regression analysis of them, found the midpoint of that control, came up with a genotoxic uh, potency value. And then the index value is the reciprocal of this, of this value times 1,000. And so now this gives a genotoxic index value of 3.9. These are the data that come from the genotoxicity. And so right away, something comes out on here. Again, the tap water turns out to be the lowest uh, response, which you would expect because I'm taking the, the tap water, I'm dumping in organic material, and I'm blasting the stuff away with disinfectants. You, if, if I didn't get a low tap water, I would be a uh, response I'd get uh, rather concerned. But now we can see we have a bunch of different variables here. What causes this difference in response? Well, first of all, again, all disinfected rec recreational water samples were more genotoxic than the source of tap water. Uh, the type of disinfectant and the environment altered the, the genotoxicity of water, and I'll show that in the next couple slides. TOC was correlated, was statistically correlated with a genotoxicity. So that says if you can lower your total organic, con con uh, uh, total organic content of that water, you're going to lower the genotoxicity of that water. Now, two things came out that were very interesting. This and this, these are both pool waters that were treated with UV and chlorine. They were both indoor, but they were taken at two different extreme times of the year, two different times of the year. They're both indoor. They have levels that are higher than tap water, but they essentially are the same value. That's an important observation. These two here are, are, two, are, are is a single pool. Again, it, this, this pool here, uh, is treated with free chlorine. However, in the summertime, the, the roof is moved back, and it essentially becomes an outdoor pool. In the wintertime, the roof is, encloses the pool, and now it becomes an indoor pool. And you can see that there's a significant jump between, uh, uh, in terms of genotoxicity of that water, uh, uh, because of reduced, I assume, because of reduced ventilation. But also this, you have ultraviolet radiation streaming down on that outdoor pool, which is breaking up probably a lot of the DVPs that are being generated. Chip actually gave us some elegant information about that this morning. And so just by having it exposed to the sun, you, use, you lose a lot of genotoxicity in that identical pool. Um, 
don't use brominated disinfectants. In the literature, there is a clear, very, very clear response that says you have uh, much higher levels of genotoxicity and adverse health effects associated with brominated uh, DBPs. If you use a brominated disinfectant, you're going to make more brominated DBPs. So this is uh, pool uh, sample four. It was, uh, it was uh, disinfected with bromochlorodimethylhydantan, and you can see it is by far the most genotoxic of all the pool samples. Compare that with the negative control. So this is something that clearly indicates that you don't want to have, you generate high cytotoxicity and exceedingly high genotoxicity based on this disinfectant. So the disinfectant that you use is really important. So what is the take home message uh, from this? Well, first of all, this was the first systematic cytot cytotoxicity and genotoxicity study on mammalian cells uh, of recreational pool waters that came from a common tap water source. The type of disinfectant, temperature, and pool environment affect the cytotoxicity and genotoxicity of recreational uh, of waters. So the most genotoxic, the most genotoxic are brominated-based disinfectants. The next one is chlorine. And the third one that gives us the least levels of genotoxicity and cytotoxicity is chlorine plus UV. Uh, a reduction in TOC may be achieved by reducing cosmetic and personal care products, which, which can be converted into toxic agents after chlorination. Knocking down TOC is associated with reducing genotoxicity. Not so much cytotoxicity, but genotoxicity. So get all that stuff off of you before you jump in the pool. Avoid brominated disinfectants. Explore using chlorine plus UV disinfectants. During recycling of water, the organic carbon could be removed by, uh, uh, by filtration or by such things as granulated activated carbon. That's going to reduce your TOC, which will reduce your genotoxicity. Swimmers should be encouraged to shower. We just talked about that before entering the water. And patrons should be, yelled, should be told don't pee in the pool because all you're doing there is adding more precursors for, not, for two things. Number one, more organic material. But there's a second thing. I haven't had a chance to talk with you, but we've published many papers showing that nitrogenous DBPs are much more genotoxic and cytotoxic than carbonaceous DBPs. So if you put a, if you put a nitrogen on a DBP, it becomes much more genotoxic. Gosh, what do you think your sources of nitrogen are in a, in a pool? It's going to come from, uh, from urine, as Chip also pointed out. And I just want to acknowledge uh, Diane Levesque uh, Manos was a graduate student uh, who came to work in our laboratory, Bill Mitch from Yale, uh, my wife of 38 years. I wake her up every morning and tell her how lucky she is, uh, who's worked with me side by side in the laboratory. And of course, we thank uh, the, Na the National Science Foundation to provide the grant money. That means you guys, the taxpayers, and then also uh, the uh, uh, water campus program at the University of Illinois. I'll take some questions. <laughs> Yes. Say that again. I, I, uh, oh, the piping systems. Oh. Uh, gee, I hadn't thought of that. If you have biofilms on there, perhaps, but I think really not. Uh, I don't think that you're going to be adding into that pool, uh, you know, you might be thinking of something like heavy metals, leads, or something like that. That's not going to affect this at all. At those, you'd have to, uh, you'd have. Listen, if that was the case, all the pool operators would be walking into walls, and and you know, they'd all become professors because there'd be some brain damage. So, now I don't think that you'd have. I don't think that would make an effect. And you had two questions. Yeah. Uh, the second one is on the pool that comes from both an indoor and an outdoor. Yes. Uh, remember, I said. So she asked the question, the question about. Um, need to repeat the question. Okay, the question was in that one pool that we had uh, differences in the indoor and outdoor effect with the pool with the movable roof and stuff. Was there a difference in bather load? And remember, at the beginning of this talk, I said I could come up with a million <laughs> flaws in the experiment. We did not take into account bather load, and, and we just didn't do that. Uh, yes.
has different right right well the, i wasn't aware of that to be the, uh, the question was are are in fact these pools all from a common source water and and this individual here pointed out that the pool with the the Cheshire with a movable cover removable cover uh, uh, came from the same utility, but they could have different source waters. I wasn't aware of that. The professor from Yale, I assume, would have contacted the regional water authority. Is there, right. When you took your sample of this portable sample, your baseline income, where was that sample taken? He took it, I think, he, I don't know exactly where he took that from. It was from a tap water. It may, it may be from a tap water uh, uh, from, from Yale. I don't know exactly where the tap water came from. So again, a, a, a design flaw, I apologize. The, the thing that was different there, of course, is that there was a profound difference between the indoor and outdoor uh, uh, response, because that was the same pool. So, that, so, so even though we're not comparing, we may not be comparing it with that exact tap water source as the others, the same pool was sampled when the cover was open and when the cover was closed, and we did find that response. Right, and you'll notice though, and you'll notice she that. She wants to summarize that question. He's okay, not the, sum, any uh, the, the, the question is again was that in the summertime you would get more surface water, in the wintertime you get more well water, but you'll notice in the summertime the genotoxicity actually went down, uh, as, uh, and in the wintertime the genotoxicity went up. So we believe, and I think the data would support it, that the environment of the pool itself affected the toxicity of the water within that pool. Well, the water, the source water. Repeat was the question, please. The, the 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 question was, was the source water disinfected with chlorine? The source water was disinfected, so all so those pools received tap water to fill their pools, so they weren't disinfected. No, I mean with chloramines. Oh, with chloramines, I don't know. Okay. You know, uh, you bring up something very important. We do not have a complete, comprehensive study. There is not a comprehensive study to ask the question, if I take the same source waters, and if I change bromine and iodine concentrations in there, and then, let, and then uh, treat with either chlorine or chloramines to meet EPA standards, which complex mixture of isolated organics is more toxic? We have an EPA star grant that we're doing that now, but we won't have that data for another year. But that's a fundamental, I'm flabbergasted that no one has done this study. What's my colleagues doing? I mean, this is an obvious question. It hasn't been done. So we're doing that now. All right, thank you very much.